Hello, my name is Roger Watson and welcome to this session on planning and conducting an investigation using quantitative methods. First of all, let's review the types of quantitative investigation we can undertake. First of all, there are randomised controlled trials and surveys. And we're going to cover both of these here. That's essentially it. That's essentially the split between the two types of quantitative designs, although there are variations within those particular types. And if we look at what's called the hierarchy of evidence, randomised, controlled, double-blind trials are at the top of that hierarchy of evidence, and other randomised control studies and different kinds of experiments lie lower down. So we'll look at these first. Having said that, not everything requires a randomised controlled trial. For example, if we wanted to find out how effective parachutes were, I don't think we'd need to do one. So we do need to apply them appropriately. The quantitative research process can be looked at as follows. All research begins with a theory, which is tested using hypotheses. A theory may be, for example, that gender affects people's intelligence and an hypothesis may be females perform better than males in examinations as an indicator of intelligence, something like that. A hypothesis has to be something that can be tested. So the concepts have to be operationalised. That's just a horrible way of saying that we need to have ways of measuring what the outcomes are and of knowing what the people are that we want to put into this experiment. In other words, we need to define what we're measuring and who we're measuring. Then participants need to be selected. Somehow, there are different means of doing this. We'll look at one particular way in relation to randomised controlled trials here. So, there's a dichotomy here. In survey designs, we can use interviews or questionnaires. In experimental designs, we use treatment versus control groups. Both of these generate data, which we can then analyse to produce results, which can then feed back to inform us on whether our theory was correct or not, or at least to give us some insight into that. I have to say that's a very simple and a very quick way of looking at that process. It isn't always as easy to do. So first of all, let's take a look at randomised controlled trials. And this diagram summarises a randomised control nicely. You have a reference population from which you take a study population, and then you have your study subjects, in other words, the ones who agree to come into your study. We usually call them participants these days. Then they'll be allocated randomly to a treatment group and a control group, and then an outcome will be measured. And we need to follow how many people don't make it through to the end of the experiment or the end of the trial. The cardinal features of a randomised controlled trial, otherwise referred to from this point on as an RCT, are threefold. Randomisation, control, and blinding, and I'm going to look at each of these in turn. So now we'll look at each of these in turn. First of all, randomization. Randomization is used to minimize bias in allocating participants to the arms of an experiment. In other words, we don't decide how they get into that arm. This is decided on the basis of some random method, and it's usually done using random numbers usually these days generated by a computer. Each person in your study will be allocated a number and then by some means you will generate those numbers randomly and then you will select the people into the study when their number comes up, as it were. Sometimes you can't randomise. It isn't always possible and other designs can be used and these are all essentially quasi-experiments. A quasi-experiment is something that's got most of the features of an experiment but there's something missing. Or we can use cluster designs where we allocate for example one treatment to one hospital and the control to another 
but this can be done if you've got enough hospitals in such a way that you can actually get this to be reasonably randomly distributed across and such designs require the input of a very experienced statistician. So we can ask ourselves if a design is an experiment or not. So if random assignment is used, then yes, it's a randomized or a true experiment. If not, you can then ask, is there a control group or multiple measures? If so, yes, then it's a quasi-experiment. If not, it's a non-experiment. So for example, a quasi-experiment would be non-random assignment into two groups and then measuring an outcome after some sort of intervention, in this case, a program. Control is used to minimize the effects of the placebo effect, maturation or history. The placebo effect is an effect that is due to simply being part of the study and nothing to do with the treatment that's actually being investigated and maturation or history takes into account the fact that many people, whatever's wrong with them, will get better anyway. So these things need to be taken into account and the only way you can take this into account in an experiment is to have a group that undergoes the same things as the experimental group goes undergoes but doesn't receive the treatment. So a control group is essentially a group that's treated the same as the experimental group but without the treatment. Very hard on social interventions, and I'm sure you'll agree. Finally, blinding. This is also used to minimise bias, but it's used to minimise bias in responses by participants and also by data collectors. In other words, you try to minimise the likelihood that the person who's taking part in the experiment knows which arm of the study they're in, or that the data collector knows this. It can be single-blinded, in other words, one or other party doesn't know, or ideally it can be double-blinded, where both parties don't know. Again, sometimes this is very hard to achieve, and again, in social research it can be quite hard to achieve, especially using talk therapies where it's obvious that somebody's receiving the therapy. Next, a quick word on sample size, which is essential in quantitative research, but there is another presentation on sample size, which is separate from this one. Power analysis is used uh, to estimate sample size, and sample size is related to the statistical test to be used, the likely effect size, in other words, for example, in uh, an experiment, the difference between the groups in the study. And there are some tables and algorithms and there are computer programs available to help you work out sample sizes. But if in any doubt, I would strongly advise you to take the advice of an experienced statistician. So I won't go into this in any detail here. There is another presentation on sample size. In terms of experiments, there are other more recent designs, for example, Complex interventions, which acknowledge the complexity of interventions. It acknowledges the fact that there are often multiple outcomes and multiple inputs, and it's very difficult to differentiate them. And the Medical Research Council produces some copious guidelines on this. There are also pragmatic trials, which essentially test things in the real world without too much manipulation. So it's willing to look at groups of people coming into GP surgery who receive a particular group compared to those who don't, but there's no actual setting up of that situation. So these test drugs under real life conditions and in many ways can be very powerful. So don't see these as lesser interventions. They have to be done very carefully. They're just alternatives which can be used where randomized controlled trials are frankly impossible. In relation to randomized control trials, it's well worth having a look at the CONSORT webpage. CONSORT is concerned with good practice in reporting clinical trials. However, if you're setting up a clinical trial, it's also well worth looking at. In particular, having a look at the CONSORT checklist. The checklist shows you what the ingredients of a good report are, but they also show you what the ingredients of a good clinical trial are. In addition, there's a flow diagram here for reporting 
the flow of participants through a clinical trial. And this is also well worth having a look at and well worth knowing that this is what you have to do if you report a clinical trial. This is what the consort flow diagram looks like. And the consort flow diagram is there to help you keep track of everyone who could possibly be in your trial, those who were actually admitted to the trial and randomized to the different arms, and then keeping a track of the people who are in your trial right to the end. So you can keep a track of all those who dropped out and those who finally made it. This enables you to do your intention to treat analysis. And intention to treat analysis is now considered a gold standard in reporting clinical trials, albeit that there is some controversy around it. I'll leave you to look up intention to treat by yourself and the controversies around it on the internet. However, I'm going to show you an example. So this diagram shows a consort type flow diagram following patients through a randomized controlled trial. And this is a trial of usual care versus self-management in GP practices. General practitioners identified a number of people, 368 for usual care and 283 for self-management. And these were the people who were eligible to be in the randomized controlled trial. However, some weren't willing to participate and some couldn't participate due to some exclusion criteria based on laboratory values. So then 104 patients were left in the usual care, 110 in the self-management care arms. However, many of these didn't start or dropped out for some reason. So in fact, 95 and 98 participants respectively were left in the usual care and self-management group. And this is called the intention to treat analysis level. What happens after that is that some people with, withdrew Others lost the follow-up, they may have died or whatever. 86 completed the trial and 85 completed the trial respectively in the two arms. Now the problem is that people may have dropped out differentially from the two arms. So it can bias the outcome if you only look at the outcomes from the people who are left in the trial, as used to be done for many years. What's considered good practice now, as I said in the previous slide, is to go back up a level and look at all the people who could have been included in the trial and analyse the data at that level. That's what intention to treat analysis means. That's a very quick overview. As I say, I leave you to look this up yourself and to be aware that there are also controversies surrounding this. But uh, good journals like the Lancet, the British Medical Journal and so forth require you to do intention to treat analysis when you're reporting the outcomes of randomized controlled trials. Next, let's take a look at survey designs. Why would you use a survey? Well, they're relatively cheap to do. Of course, they'd be suitable when you can't do or don't want to do a randomized controlled trial. They're designed for different reasons. You can gather data from a large number of people and you can use standardised questions and get standardised responses. Also, while I wouldn't necessarily advise it, you can do this type of research by yourself. It's much easier to do in some ways than, for example, carrying out a randomised control trial, which involves a great many people. I'm not trying to downplay the method or make it look simple. I'm just saying that it's different. So survey methods, first of all, we look at design, then data collection, and then sample size, then return rate. So under survey design, there are two basic divisions. First of all, cross-sectional designs, and then longitudinal designs. We'll look at these in turn. First of all, cross-sectional studies have got advantages and disadvantages. One of the main advantages is they are relatively easy to conduct. One of the main disadvantages are that the information obtained from these is relatively limited. Longitudinal studies have also got advantages and disadvantages. Advantage, they're very informative. 
disadvantage, they're relatively hard to conduct. There are different types of longitudinal study. There are trend studies, cohort studies and panel studies. And all of these differ from cross-sectional studies in that cross-sectional studies are done once and once only, they're not repeated. So there are advantages and disadvantages within these different types of studies. A trend study uses the same population, for example the population of Hong Kong, but not necessarily the same people. These are the types of surveys that are used to look at political trends. People go out and sample people on the street and ask them what they're going to vote. Then they go out a week later and they ask people again, but it's not the same people. That's good at picking up trends and populations. A cohort sample will use the same sample, for example the nursing class of 2010, but not necessarily the same people. It may use the same people, but not necessarily. If it does, it will be a panel study, which is really a type of cohort study. It uses the same sample, but uses exactly the same people. Trend studies are very informative about trends, but not very informative about the people in them. Cohort studies are quite informative about trends and quite informative about people, and as you imagine, panel studies are least informative about trends, but most informative about people. Trend studies are relatively easy to conduct. They're essentially a series of cross-sectional studies. Sampling is easy. Cohort studies are harder to conduct, very vulnerable to attrition, or at least quite vulnerable to attrition compared with panel studies, which are very hard to conduct and also very vulnerable to attrition. So there are advantages and disadvantages to these methods. So let's look at questionnaires. Questionnaires can be postal, these are called self-administered, that's when you fill them in yourself, or they can be done by interview, researcher administered. Postal is very convenient, you can use very large samples, but you get a lower return rate. If you use an interview face-to-face, -face, it's quite inconvenient, you can do it by telephone. Less convenient, as I say, very limited sample size, but you do tend to get a higher return rate. Everything within research design is a trade-off. Second point about data collection is return rate. What you've got to do in surveys, if you're planning one, is to make participation and completion of the questionnaires as easy as possible. Make return of questionnaires as easy as possible. So under the first point, carry out interviews at the convenience of the participant, the right place and the right time, make the questionnaire as short as possible and make the questionnaire as user-friendly as possible. If you're using a postal questionnaire, use stamped self-addressed envelopes. Use accessible collection points. Don't expect people who are participating in your study to do any work to do it for you, do all the work for them. Make it as convenient as possible or you won't get your questionnaires back. You can design a perfect questionnaire, but if you don't get it out and you don't get it back, you've wasted your time. Questionnaire design. There are different types. Design, and we'll look at the psychometrics and sampling, and then finally, very briefly, at analysis. Types of questionnaire. There are factual and demographic questionnaire which ask people about, for example, where they live, what their gender is, what they earn. You can ask people about their opinion or their attitudes or perceptions. These things are much the same but subtly different. You can also use questions to make diagnosis. There are different types of data collection. You can do it postally or by interview, as I've already said, or by telephone, but increasingly people are using the World Wide Web. Most important if you're planning a quantitative study, 
by survey method using a questionnaire that you put the maximum effort you can into designing your questionnaire. You've got to be clear what you want to find out. You've got to be clear right from the beginning how you're going to analyse the data. This is one of the most important decisions you can make in the design of a questionnaire. What will it look like when I get the data in and how can I analyse it and indeed can I analyse it? Do you want to use closed or open questions? On the whole, before I get there, I would say you want to use closed questions. Open questions and questionnaires can be useful as a tactic to let people make a comment about the questionnaire or add any other comment, but long series of open questions and questionnaires where you don't have control of the interview situation are next to useless. Very difficult to analyse. So types of questions, well, closed questions are very hard to write, but they're easy to analyse, and open questions are the opposite way around. They're very easy to write, but hard to analyse. You can also use numeric open-ended questions. In some circumstances, these are preferable to closed questions. I'll give you examples of these in a minute. Piloting surveys is absolutely essential to make sure that you can get the questionnaire out, get it back again, and that you can really analyse the data that are coming back. So you must go through a piloting phase. Questionnaires are really mainly common sense, so the layout's very important. Use dark, clear typeface. Don't use strange fonts or colours. Avoid that at all costs. There is some dispute about the order of the questions, but the general received wisdom is that the easy one should come first, in other words the demographics, how old are you, what's your name, what's your income, that kind of thing. People can answer them easily. The watchword in terms of designing questionnaires is KISS, keep it short and simple. If the questionnaires are completely new one, you'll have to generate items and questions, much the same thing. You can do this in various ways. There are no hard and fast rules. Literature review, qualitative interviews or observations, focus groups, that kind of thing. And you can also just use your experience and common sense. Or you can use what's been known in the past as brainstorming techniques. This is maybe not a very politically correct word, but you know what I mean. People just sitting around and throwing in ideas. Whatever you do, there has to be a process thereafter of filtering it down to getting it as short as possible. What you want to sort out is the phenomenology, in other words, the phenomena that you're asking about in the questionnaire, and to get what's called the nomological network, simply the network of words around the concept that you're trying to investigate. The concept will be your latent trait, something like depression, satisfaction, quality of life, or whatever. Include people who need the information and people who may provide the information in designing your questionnaire. So in that way you'll find out how people who are likely to respond to it will actually respond to the specific questions and you'll find out if it's useful to the people who've asked you to design it or who may, in the end, make use of the information. If you're doing a literature review, do it as thoroughly as possible. Find out what others have reported about the phenomena you're interested in. Have others used questionnaires to investigate it? In other words, do other questionnaires exist? How good are they? Do you have to design another one? Keep a meticulous track of where the items generated by a literature review come from and this will be very helpful in reporting your survey. Qualitative methods, simple interviews, observations, focus groups. Keep these as open as possible. These don't have to be done as rigorously, for example, as you would an interview or a focus group for a phenomenological study. Probably no need to tape and transcribe, just keep notes of the main things that are coming through. You can brainstorm alone or with colleagues, with supervisors or potential participants. 
I suggest that you first cover the demographics, the who and the what characteristics, keeping the analysis in mind. Don't ask any questions that you don't need to. If all you're interested in is age and gender, don't ask about income or education or professional qualifications. Be very careful of that just one more question phenomenon if you're doing this by committee and watch that powerful characters don't get their interest represented purely because they're interested in it and detract from your study. Every extra question will cost you a participant. Second cover these substantive items, those about the phenomena that you're specifically interested in. So you can have questions like this, non-standardised questions, male, female, age can be specified, that's an open numerical question, educational qualifications, but keep these as simple as you possibly can. If you do have to ask about them, you get the idea. So when you're generating items, identify the broad themes that you may wish to investigate. This will help to give people a guide as to the sort of items that you want to generate. And fit specific items to these broad themes. If items fall outside the themes, they should probably be discarded or you may need to think very carefully about whether you have sufficient themes in there. Always treat extra items with great suspicion. Go for authenticity and directness. You can't get both, but you've got to go for both as well as you can. Try and get the questions to be authentic in terms of hitting the target, but also including as many phenomena around it as possible, but also get them direct so that you're not including too many additional phenomena. There are no formal methods to measure authenticity and directness, but you need to be careful that you're covering all of the phenomena but you're not asking any additional questions. The balance between these two is crucial in affecting how usable your questionnaire is. If you need to ask it, then ask it. If you don't need to ask it, then don't. I'll say it again, just avoid the one more question trap. Most items will be obvious, obvious and will come early. I always describe this as follows. You'll see the elephants very quickly. Avoid all the mosquitoes. And question every additional item. Writing items, well I've said it already, keep it short and simple. Avoid negatives and double negatives. Try not to ask negative questions unless you really have to. And don't ask double negative questions. Do you not like something? Make it straightforward and easy to answer. Try not to have double barreled questions. People can't interpret, at least you won't be able to interpret the negative answers. If you say to someone, do you like living in Europe and studying at such and such university? If they say yes, well, you reckon that they like both. But if they say no, you don't know if they're saying no to both. They're actually remarkably difficult to eliminate. It's very easy to write the wrong type of questions. But read them all over very carefully, get other people to read them, pilot it to make sure you've got rid of anything that looks ambiguous. Well, response formats can vary. Open, tell me about living in Hong Kong. As I say, I, I would try to avoid these wherever possible. You can use them as a tactic to get people to give you some comments on the questionnaire. Open numerical, how much do you earn? How old are you? Closed, do you like Italy? Yes or no? The type of closed response formats depends on what you find out and how you want to use the information and also how you want to analyse it. Some other points to consider. Have you included all the possible options where options are provided? For example, if you've got a five option question which is supposed to go from strongly agree to agree through don't know to disagree and strongly disagree, make sure that you've got the right balance. It's quite easy to miss them out. If you're using cut and paste, make sure you don't have the same answer at both ends of the question. So have you provided a balanced spread of choices for choices such as options are to be selected? And are the options mutually exclusive? Make sure that you don't have two agrees or two don't knows. 
Should you provide a neutral or a midpoint response, the jury is out on this. If you produce one, if you use a midpoint response, then there is a tendency that people who don't know may go down the middle, and some people who are not so conscientious as others may go down the middle anyway. If you have a an equal uh, spread of responses, then you force people to go one way or the other. The problem with the latter is that some people won't answer the question if they don't like it, whereas at least if you've got a middle response, they can say don't know quite honestly, but it really depends what you want to achieve from it. Here's an example of a five-point Likert scale with a neutral point in the middle. Strongly, agree, do, strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, or don't know, agree, strongly agree. Pilot studies are essential. You have to test the content and the utility of the questionnaire. In other words, you have to tip, dip your toe in the water before you plunge in completely and waste resources. So you can test the content by asking people to rate the relevance of items, the user friendliness by asking people to use the questionnaires, the survey designed to test if questionnaires can be returned to you, for example. That's one of the most important aspects of piloting. On data collection, the sample size is important. You need to send it out to the right number of people. We do have a separate session on sample size, but just briefly here. You've got to decide how many people to whom the questionnaire should be sent. The answer is enough to make the results representative of the population and no more than is necessary to achieve it because you'll waste resources and sample size will be related to the size of the population. It also depends on the statistical test you're going to use and power analysis is very important there if you're looking for example at mean differences, correlations, regressions and that kind of thing. And there's an excellent paper by Cohen called a Power Primer in the Psychological Bulletin, which is well worth reading and explains power and gives you tables there which are ready reckoners for working out sample size. Don't forget that the more you fine grain your sample, the more people you need. If you've got a total sample of 100 divided into men and women who are young and old and then sick or well, you see the numbers get very small. So if you need a sick old woman for your sample, for example, you're going to need uh, something like, if you've got a sample of 100, you're going to need four or five times as many as that before you get sufficient. If your sample size calculation says you need 100 of them, for example, so just don't forget that you need to multiply up if you're fine graining your sample down to particular kinds of people within it and you've only got a certain number available and you're going to be doing statistical tests which rely on ultimate sample size. So if you just had 100 people which might be adequate to test certain things, if you wanted to look at the comparison between women who were younger and sick between those who were well, you've only got 13 in one group and 12 in the other. That's not enough to do a statistical test. And here's a ready reckoner taken from uh, Jackson Furman's book on survey methods, and I'm not going to go into it in any detail here, but 95% confidence and margin of error are the usual parameters you use here. These are related to how confident you are about the uh, number of people answering questions in a particular way, or what the likely distribution of answers to questions is. But the main thing to notice here is that if you've got under 200 people, you take the whole sample, if you've got 100,000 people, you take approximately 400. The two values and the population size and the sample size are not linearly related. So don't think that because the population is huge that you need to take necessarily a huge sample. So how is a sample obtained? Well, if you take the whole population, you're taking all the members of a particular group, but that's usually not feasible unless the population is very small. And sometimes you do want to take all of the population. But usually we want to take a sample, which is a subset of the population, and that sample can either be representative, in other words, like the population, the best way to do that is to take it randomly, or it may be biased, a sample that's unlike the population. And you can work out something called the sampling error, 
which is the difference between the two. If you know the characteristics of the population and if you know the characteristics of the sample that you take, which is quite easy to work out, then you can see what the difference between the two is and that's called the sampling error. There are two basic types of sampling methods, probability sampling and non-probability sampling. Probability sampling can be done by simple random uh, allocation of numbers to a population and then selection or by stratified random. And there are other methods here which ensure that you get as representative a sample as possible. I'm not going to go into them in detail here. You can use things called block designs and such like. It's quite complex and I think for sampling you really need to get the advice of a qualified and experienced statistician if you're in any doubt. Non-probability sampling can simply be opportunistic. The first people who come along, it can be systematic. Every tenth person in a clinic or purpose of getting people who deliberately only have particular characteristics and that's more commonly used of course in qualitative research. Bias samples result from poor sampling. They may result from poor response rates. For example, only middle class educated and motivated, motivated people may respond to a survey. That's a classic reason for having a biased sample. In terms of response rate, what's a good response rate? How do we account for a poor likely response rate? And what is the problem with poor response rate? So what is a good response rate? Well, 30% is usually considered pretty good. For some types of studies it may not be enough. But if you do a power calculation or sample size calculation and you work out that you need 100 people, you wouldn't go out and sample 100 and then be happy with 30 of them, roughly. You would want to sample about 300 people and then get 30% of them. So you've got to work it up from your likely response rate. So sometimes you've got to estimate that and work out what you need to do to get a big enough sample from a population, provided the population is big enough. So you have to ensure good response rates. So simple things like a covering letter, the method of delivery of the questionnaire, and crucially, the method of returning completed questionnaires is very important. Covering letter should cover, well, it should be legible, should be readable. By readability, I don't just mean legibility, I mean the kind of language used. Don't assume a high level of education. Don't use long words, long sentences or complicated paragraphs. And the length. You can have all these things checked, by the way. And there are guidelines, certainly in most National Health Service Trusts in the UK, on how to write a covering letter and, for example, an information sheet for a study. The style should be not informal, but not too formal and certainly not scientific. And you should assure people anonymity. Essential features to include is who's carrying out the research, who is the research being done for, who is funding the research, why is the recipient of the letter important? In other words, try and get them on your side, but do it honestly. And what will taking part involve? But you'd also explain that clearly in the information sheet. And what will happen to the data? And how will their confidentiality be ensured? And also tell them how to get the completed questionnaires, if it's a hard copy questionnaire, back to you and by when. So a good covering letter, a personally signed letter is best. Handwritten envelopes with stamps are very effective, but in large studies may be hard to do. And also there may need to be some incentives to participate, although that is a controversial area. Make returning the completed questionnaire easy. I've said that several times, but I can't emphasise it enough. You may need to have a follow-up procedure. However, you've got to be careful regarding anonymity if you're following up people. You need to know specifically who they are if they haven't returned the questionnaire. Don't just send out a blanket letter again reminding everyone because some people may return more than one questionnaire. You won't know which one it is and then your data are useless. So you really have to think this through. That's something I'm going to go into de to detail about here but this is 
one of the difficult aspects of research, getting these administrative things done correctly. For handling the data that come back, just be organised, it goes without saying, ensure that the return address is unambiguous, ensure you store all the, store all the returns safely in the same place, make sure you know where they are at the end of the study. Data are very precious indeed, don't lose anything. You need to code questionnaires, so each questionnaire must have a unique identifying number. If you've got 500, then you could number them 001 up to 500. Open numerical questions don't require coding, but closed questions do require coding. For example, male could be 1, female could be 2, nurse could be 1, doctor could be 2, patient could be 3. Responses need to be coded. Yes, no, could be one or two. And like up type scales, five, four, three, two, or one, or the other way around. It doesn't matter as long as you're consistent and as long as you know what those responses mean. The purpose of this is to produce a matrix which can be used for statistical analysis by, for example, an SPSS package. So every subject needs to have a number and every response Category needs to be identified along the top and have a suitable response underneath it. Quantitative analysis, we're not going to talk too much about statistics here, but basically you would do either descriptive or inferential or multivariate. Descriptive would look at the means and the standard deviations, for example, of people's age. Inferential could be looking at t-tests between means or correlation between variables. Multivariate would include things like factor analysis, which can be exploratory or confirmatory. There are separate sessions on different kinds of statistical analysis. So descriptive mainly refers to the demographic data, how many men, how many women. So here you want numbers, percentages or proportions. Inferential looks at links between the variables, so differences between groups, relationships between variables, or contribution of independent variables. Don't forget your analysis should be contextual. Relate the analysis back to the theoretical perspectives or hypothesis which drove the study and avoid data dredging. Don't go into the study data in such a way that you come up with spurious relationships. It must be hypothesis driven. So thank you very much for listening. This is my email address for any comments or questions and you can follow me on Twitter. Once again, thank you very much.